I have been a full-time evangelist for almost 11 years. In fact, in August of this year, it will be um, 11 years. And I can tell you that in all my travels as I've presented the gospel, I've come across a surprising number of consistent questions that guests have asked me. Uh, I do a presentation on the subject of baptism. And one of the things that I share is that before you're baptized, you have to repent. And over the years, when I held these seminars, I had people ask me, Pastor, what do I do? I know that what I am doing is wrong, but I don't feel bad about it. That's a real question, you know. I mean, what do you do if you know that you're doing wrong, but you don't feel sorry? And for a number of months, I was stumped. Like, what do you do for someone like that? What do you say to someone when they know that they're doing wrong, but they just don't feel wrong? Or they don't feel bad enough to stop? And then I read a book by W.D. Frizee, a different one. It's called Ransom and Reunion. And he shares this story, and I want to share it with you tonight. Suppose that you came to my home, and inviting you to take a seat to have some refreshments, you walk by the coffee table, and as you walk by, your leg hit the coffee table. Not hard but just enough to cause the vase on the table to totter precariously before crashing to the floor. I'm sure that most of us, I think, would feel embarrassed, upset, perhaps, uh, and, and hopefully sorry. Isn't that true? And so, with a bit of... Uh, perhaps, you know, discomfort and unease, you apologize profusely and you say, please, let me help you clean it up. Let me fix this. And so you get a dustpan and a broom and you start sweeping everything up into the dustpan. And as you dispose of what you thought was a mess, you ask the simple question, what can I do to replace this? Tell me where you bought it, and I'll buy you another one. Now, I hope, and I, I, I imagine that most of us would probably say that if we had done that, we would be falling over ourselves, being apologetic and being sorry for what we had done. I think all of us, I think, would feel that way. But suppose that I said to you, suppose I said, I am so thankful for the sentiment to want to replace that. But that particular vase was made by Tiffany and Company. There are only three others like it in the world. And if you wanted to replace it, it would cost you several million dollars. Now, I want you to just think about that for a moment. I want you to just think about how you would feel after I said that. Would you feel the same, better, or worse? worse. You'd feel worse, right? And the reason why, if you really think about why you feel worse, the reason you would feel worse is because now, for the first time, you have begun to understand the true cost of that which you broke. You know, people sin because they like to sin. And if we do not understand what sin costs, we will be reckless in our pursuit of sin. But especially, especially viewing the closing scenes of the life of Jesus, 
has the ability to help us understand more clearly why and what sin is, that it should require such a tremendous sacrifice on the part of the Son of God. If you are here tonight and you know that there are sins in your life and you know that they're sins, but you like it and you don't feel any different about it, one of the ways that we can find true repentance, one of the only ways that we can find a sorrow for sin is when we meditate especially on the closing scenes of the life of Jesus. This week, our theme are those closing scenes. But as I was preparing for this, I could not overlook Uh, I could not overlook the fact that the closing scenes of Jesus' life have a special meaning for God's people living in the last days. Now, some of you may know that the closing scenes of Jesus' life have a parallel to the closing scenes of human history. And I'm going to just give you a few examples so that you can understand this. First of all, when Jesus was persecuted and ultimately delivered to be killed, do you realize that in order for that to happen, there needed to be a combination of apostate religion with the power of the state? Does that make sense? In other words, Apostate religion needed the arm of the state in order to persecute Jesus and to ultimately bring about his death. And if you are a student of Bible prophecy, you will know that before Jesus comes, we will see another union of apostate religion and the state power united to persecute God's faithful people. Now, that's not the only reason. That's not the only parallel that exists. I want to read to you a quote. But before I read that, I think that most Christians will know that the death of Jesus was a event that had tremendous significance, not only for our little world, but in the, in the much bigger picture of the controversy between Christ and Satan, there were eternal realities that were at stake that were dependent on Jesus living a perfect life and offering a perfect sacrifice. In other words, when Jesus died, it wasn't merely a world event that that had significance for our little world. It was an event that had significance for the onlooking universe. Other worlds, heaven was interested in this controversy that was taking place here on our little planet. But some of you may know that the final crisis right before Jesus comes is also of similar interest to the onlooking universe. I want to read you this statement from a book called Prophets and Kings, page 148. The Lord abhors indifference and disloyalty in a time of crisis in his work. The whole universe is watching with what? Inexpressible interest. The closing scenes of the great controversy between good and evil. Now, it's not my subject matter for tonight, but let me say that there is another issue that needs to be proven to the onlooking universe. 
And so other worlds, heaven is looking down at our planet once again with inexpressible interest. They are keenly observing the events that are going on on this planet right now with a special focus on the people of God that call themselves the remnant. And I want you to know that that similarity between the, the sacrifice of Jesus and the events surrounding that and the closing scenes of human history, they tell me that the closing scenes of Jesus' life have a, have a parallel to God's people who are living in these last days. Now, I don't need to tell you that when Jesus died, he was betrayed by someone that was very close to him. I think most people recognize that Judas was one of the 12. But I want to share something with you that may help you see a parallel between the betrayal of Jesus by Judas and the coming crisis at the end of time. Here's a statement from a book, The Great Controversy. And here's what it says. As the storm approaches, a large class who have professed faith in the third angel's message, but have not been sanctified through obedience to the truth, abandon their position and join the ranks of the opposition. By uniting with the world and partaking of its spirit, they have come to view matters in nearly the same light. And when the test is brought, they are prepared to choose the easy and popular side. Men of talent and pleasing address who once rejoiced in the truth employ their powers to deceive and mislead souls. They become the most, what? Bitter enemies of their former brethren. When Sabbath keepers are brought before the courts to answer for their faith, these apostates are the most efficient agents of Satan to misrepresent and accuse them and by false reports and insinuations to stir up the rulers against them. Will there be another betrayal of God's people once more before Jesus comes, yes or no? Yeah. Now, I hope you can see, now, I've spent the first part of my message tonight just trying to lay a kind of a foundation of what we want to do this week. Yes, if we want true repentance, we need to have a much clearer appreciation for the sacrifice of Jesus, especially meditating on the closing scenes of his life. But don't miss that as we study night by night, as we go through those closing scenes, the very things that Jesus went through, those very things that Jesus experienced, are some of the same things that God's people will experience right before Jesus comes back a second time. Now, I'm not, I don't, I don't enjoy dwelling on the negative. I, I hope you understand that as we spend these next days, our goal really is to understand what we can do to prepare for the glory of the second coming. But do you realize that before that day comes, there is a crisis that is ahead of us? And so keep in mind that before we get to that glory, there is some trials and tribulations that we will go through. I'm going to ask you to take your Bibles and open with me to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 26 tonight, if you will. Matthew, chapter 26. I want to ask you to look with me, starting in verse 30. Matthew, chapter 26, and verse 30. Now, as we begin, the title of my message tonight is very simple. It's called Blind. 
Now, the series is called The Closing Crisis. But the message tonight, the sermon title, is called Blind. And I want to ask you to look with me, starting in verse 30. And when they had sung a hymn, the Bible says, they went out into the Mount of Olives. Verse 31, then said Jesus unto them, all ye shall be offended because of me this night. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. Now, I want to pause here. If you remember, they had, they had just finished the Last Supper. And if you compare this with other gospel accounts, Jesus had made intimation that he would be betrayed. And now we see that Jesus is telling them that all of them would be offended because of him that night. Now, I want you to notice that in verse 32, Jesus pointed them to the coming glory. But after that I am risen again, I will go before you into Galilee. But notice what Peter said. Peter answered and said unto him, Though all men shall be offended because of thee, yet will I never be offended. Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, that this night before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. Verse 35, Peter said unto him, Though I should die with thee, yet will I not deny thee. And verse, the last part of verse 35 says, Likewise also said how many? All the disciples. Now, have you ever in your life been told by someone you're going to do this, but I don't want you to do it. And then you end up doing exactly what they predicted you would do. Have you ever had that experience? I'm going to share a story with you. Um, when I was learning to wakeboard and water ski, um, if you've ever been wakeboarding or water skiing, you will know exactly what I'm talking about. My instructor told me, he said, when you finally pull up out of the water, don't pull on the rope. Just let the rope pull you. Okay, some of you are smiling because you understand. So as soon as I pulled up, the, the natural human reaction is that you want to be, because you're kind of in a reclining position, and you kind of want to be up. And so the natural way to do that is to pull on the rope, and the problem is that when you do that, there's a slack in the rope, and you lose lift, and then you just sink. And for the first 15 tries, same problem. I'd pull on the rope, there would be slack, fall straight into the water. And even though he said it, and the instructor said, don't pull on the rope, it's like your mind instinctively does whatever it can to right itself, and you don't even think about what he said. You just do it. It's instinctive. It's like you don't even think about what's happening. And so I understood what I was supposed to do, but I couldn't do it. It was just unnatural for me. And Jesus is telling Peter, he's telling the disciples, tonight, all of you are going to be offended because of me. Now, the reason I titled the sermon Blind is because the irony of this statement is that Peter, and not just Peter, but all the disciples, could not see the true nature of who they were at this point of the crisis. You know... I think that when we think about the last days, I think that many of us 
have this mentality. Oh, I know what the mark of the beast is. So because I know, I'm not going to get it. And we think that because we go to church on the Sabbath, we think because, you know, we have our kids in Pathfinders, we think because, you know, we might even have a generational legacy of second or third generation Adventists. And because we have that, we think when the crisis comes, I'm not going to get it. I'm not going to get the mark of the beast. I'm not going to be, I won't compromise. I won't fall into that. And you know what? Peter and the 12 disciples, their experience with Christ up until that point, they had preached, they had cast out devils, they had healed the sick, they had been sent out two by two. You could say that up until that point, they had been training with the greatest teacher to prepare them for what was coming. The blind spot that Peter and all the disciples had is that they were unaware of their true condition. I want to read to you a statement, and I want you to notice what we are told. I believe this is from the desire of ages, but let me just see once I get to the second page. Before his crucifixion, the Savior explained to his disciples that he was to be put to death and to rise again from the two. And angels were present to impress his words on minds and hearts. But the disciples were looking for temporal deliverance from the Roman yoke. And they could not tolerate the thought that he in whom all their hopes centered should suffer an ignominious death. The words which they needed to remember were banished from their minds. And when the time of trial came, it found them, what? Unprepared. The death of Jesus as fully destroyed their hopes as if he had not forewarned them. So in the prophecies, the future is open before us as plainly as it was opened to the disciples by the words of Christ. Now, if you go back, please take your Bibles and just go back two chapters, Matthew 24. Look at verses 9 and 10. Now, I think many of you will know that Matthew 24 not only describes the conditions of God's people and earth before the destruction of Jerusalem, but it also describes the events and conditions right before the second coming. Now, Matthew 24, verse 9, Jesus said, Then shall they deliver you up to be what? Afflicted and shall kill you, and you shall be hated of how many? <laughs> all nations for my name's sake. Verse 10, and then shall how many? Many be offended and shall what? Betray one another and shall hate one another. Now, I don't know if you noticed what Jesus is predicting. He's predicting the same thing that he predicted to the disciples shortly before his death. You'd be offended, you'll be persecuted, people will try to kill you. And is it possible that today God's people could know in theory what is coming, but be blind to their true readiness for what is coming? Is that possible? I want to share my heart with you tonight, <clears throat> and as I share this, I know that we're being recorded. But I'm sharing this with you because I feel like only in this way perhaps some of you can understand what God does to help us understand our character readiness for what's coming. 
So let me give you a little background um, about myself. I went to college with a business major. That was my ambition. I wanted to study business and law. And uh, my first year of college, I had a conversion experience. It was actually at the end of the year. And after my conversion experience, I went into ministry. I said, Lord, I believe you're calling me to ministry. And amazingly enough, um, I had the privilege, even in college, to just travel the world. And I had experience preaching like all over the world. And those, those experiences, they were formative. I, I saw the need around the world, and it shaped my view of ministry. And when I finally graduated, <clears throat> I wanted to go into full-time evangelism. Um, that dream would not materialize for another seven years. And in those seven years, I ended up working as a Bible teacher and just doing ministry in various capacities on my off times. But I went through this system of Adventist education, and then I started working for Adventist in institutions, and then I became a full-time evangelist. As Pastor mentioned, I worked for Amazing Facts for almost eight and a half years, and then I worked for the Oklahoma Conference as a full-time evangelist for about two and a half years. And so if you add that up, uh, that's almost... 11 years in full-time evangelism, not to mention the other seven years of my teaching career. So I had like about 18, almost 20 years of ministry under my belt. But about five years ago, I had a personal crisis. And that personal crisis was that I started to have a breakdown of my marriage. And one of the things that I observed, one of the things that, that I saw through this in hindsight now, is that you can be in ministry, you can be active in the church, you can have had the, the, the Adventist education, you know, you, you could have gone through those, those education bills, you could have done all of that. But your Christian experience is tested when you go through a crisis. In other words, all of the outside accoutrements that you might have that make you look like a dyed-in-the-wool Adventist, none of those things really prepares you for the crises that you face in life if you don't have a clear knowledge of who you are and a real meaningful relationship with Jesus. Now, let me just share this with you, um, because I don't want to glorify sin, but one thing I will say is that even though I was in ministry, and I had all of these years under my belt, I have to tell you that in my, through, my, through my divorce and the things that I went through, I could, I could not even recognize who I had become. Like, I said things and I did things that in hindsight, I look back and I think, who was that person? Like, who is that? And there are some of you in here, I don't wish that on anyone, but there are some of you in here that have been through experiences in your life where you've been able to see, wow, I'm not really who people think that I am. I want to tell you that I am not happy that I went through a divorce. I, no, I would, that's, that's one of those challenging and very painful experiences of life. But the plus side of that is that I began to see for the first time, I had never in my life been through a crisis like that. But for the first time in my life, I caught a glimpse of who I really was without the sanctifying power of Jesus. Can I tell you <clears throat> that there are people in here right now that don't really understand the depth of their ex Christian experience until God allows a crisis of epic proportions to come into your life. 
I want to be clear. I am not wishing you to go through something like I went through. I'm not wishing that. But what I do know is that many people are like Peter in that. They do not fully recognize the true nature of who they are in anticipation of what is coming in the future. Now, one of the things that this quote on the screen says is that the disciples, they couldn't see because they were too focused on temporal deliverance from the Roman yoke. And I have another statement similar to that. I believe that the same issue that the disciples faced, the same one, that the disciples were mostly concerned about the earthly kingdom which they thought Jesus was about to set up. That preoccupation with what this earthly kingdom was going to look like and their position in that earthly kingdom, that preoccupation made them unwilling to really hear what Jesus was telling them. I've been a pastor. I pastored for almost two and a half years. And if you have a church of decent size, and as you make your visits, and as you get to know people, the truth becomes apparent that the majority of any church, and I said that deliberately, the majority of any church is typically preoccupied with temporal things. Like if you did a survey of my church, and I love the members of my church, but if you did a survey and you asked them, what's the most important goal you have in your life right now? Like what are you working for? If they were honest, based on how they spend their time, they would tell you one of three things. I have a financial goal. Okay, there's something that I want to accomplish. I want to be debt free. I want to have no mortgage. Or they might say, I have career goals. I have this level of education and this position that I am a, a, you know, aspiring to. Or others might say, you know what? I have this relationship goal. I want to find this person and create a new life. Now, I'll tell you that all of those things in and of themselves are not bad. But keep in mind that if that is all the preoccupation that takes over the bulk of your mind, when God's Spirit seeks to impress us with the urgency of the times in which we live. When God's warnings come, go unheeded, when God is trying to let us know that, hey, the sands of time are running out and Jesus is going to come soon. Some of us have heard that so much that it's just an idiom. Jesus is coming soon. But like the disciples, it doesn't reach the innermost mind. Why? Because we're too preoccupied with other things. We're preoccupied with all these goals that all have a temporal nature to them. They're earthly. They're going to pass away at some point. And you know, my experience was that when I saw what my true self was, when I went through that crisis, I began to realize the experience that got me to this point in my life, my Christian experience until now, it's not going to be enough to get me through what's coming. I think that I could say this for all of us in here tonight. What got you here is not going to be enough 
to make it through what's coming. There is a time of trouble coming such as never was. And if we are blind, if we do not really know who we are, if we, are if we cannot recognize the true condition of our souls, like Peter, like the disciples, when that storm comes, we won't be found ready. I want to share something that <clears throat> we're told. I think this is from the fifth volume of the testimonies. <clears throat> the days of purification of the church are hastening on apace. God will have a people pure and true. In the mighty what? Sifting soon to take place. We shall be better able to judge, to measure the strength of Israel. The mark of the beast will be urged upon us. Those who have step by step yielded to worldly demands and conformed to worldly customs will not find it a hard matter to yield to the powers that be. Rather than subject themselves to derision, insult, threatened imprisonment, and death. In this time, the gold will be separated from the dross in the church. Chaff like a cloud will be borne away on the wind, even from places where we see only floors of rich wheat. Now, I read that to you because... I believe that these statements are very specific about what's going to take place and for those that fall, why they will fall when the crisis comes. I want you to look again one more time at this specific line. Those who have what? Step by step yielded to what? <clears throat> worldly demands and what else? <clears throat> Conform to worldly customs. Now, when we preach evangelistic sermons, we talk about the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. We talk about that. But I want to tell you that when we see and when we look at these statements, it's easy for us to think, oh, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. I haven't yielded to worldly customs. I haven't made step-by-step -step compromises. <clears throat> In my travels to just the different churches that I've been to, there is a very, very strong recurring theme when I talk with church members. And, you know, as I talk with church members and they tell me <clears throat> about what they struggle with, I believe that the devil has done a marvelous job of conditioning us to be just like the world. Now, don't raise your hand. This is rhetorical. Okay, but I'm going to ask you some questions. But how many of you in here have a Netflix account? Now, don't raise your hand. I'm not asking to see your hand. This is just a, a, a rhetorical question. Now, I'll tell you that in the days of television and cable TV and now the internet, it's becoming increasingly common that members spend an inordinate amount of time watching TV. And I'll be honest with you, that is a struggle for me. Like, my personality by, by nature I am visual, like I, I can easily spend hours watching television. That's why I can't get a television, because for me it would be something that would be hard to control. But the truth is that <clears throat> this is something that most church members spend more time with than they do the Bible. 
Now, <clears throat> I want to ask another question. How many of you in your families have family worship? Now, I'm not asking you to raise your hand. I'm, should, I'm only asking this because I want you to begin to think, what will it take for God's people to be prepared to stand in the final crisis? Because if we're doing everything like the world, it's a good chance that when the crisis comes, we've made so many compromises that it'll be hard to stand against the prevailing tide of popular opinion. Now, I want you to know that this statement is very specific. It says that there will come a time when people will be afraid to go against the derision, the insult, the threat of imprisonment. Now, have you noticed that today, when the media gets on someone, and you know, when they jump on a person and they start slandering them or assassinating their character, have you noticed that there are people under that kind of pressure? There's people that commit suicide. You know about that, right? And you know, we see, we see how the world is able to turn its scorn and destroy lives. We see that. And so there will be people that will capitulate under this kind of pressure. Friends, I want to tell you that if we can't be a peculiar people for God now, we won't stand when the crisis comes. Now, I have a few more statements, but I'm running out of time. Oh, that was actually the last statement. I actually want to do something tonight <clears throat> that is for me and it's for you. I'm going to ask you to take out your hymnal. I'm going to ask Audrey to come up and I'm going to ask you to open that hymn to number 287. Hymn number 287. And as Audrey plays this for us, I'm going to make a simple appeal. And the appeal is just for people here tonight that recognize their need of Jesus. Now, when I say that, I want to be specific. Maybe you've come to a point in your life where you've become preoccupied with other things. Maybe you've come to the point where you realize that Jesus has been saying things, but they haven't sunk in because all the other things have gotten in the way. But tonight you're saying, Lord, help me to understand who I really am. Lift the scales from my eyes. Help me to know who I really am. By the way, this is not a prayer for the faint of heart because often God helps us see who we really are by allowing trial to come in your life. But I want you to know that that knowledge of who you really are is essential. It's imperative if you're going to make it through what's coming. As we sing number 287, I want you to pray in your heart. And if God is speaking to you tonight, and if he is asking you to make a decision for him, to give up something of the world, maybe to start having devotions. Maybe he's asking you to have a closer walk with him. As we sing this hymn, I'm going to ask you to just stand and meditate on the words of this hymn in response to Jesus' call. Let's sing. 